thank you. Um, I would like to thank Vicki and of course the board for allowing me to speak to everyone here tonight. I passed out a uh, PowerPoint presentation since we don't have the uh, projector here, so everybody can follow along with that. Uh, I'm going to try to get through this as quick as possible. We have a lot of information, and it, it, as uh, Vicki told me, she has you know other people that are obviously speaking. So uh, if you can kind of ask me questions, uh, I appreciate it. What I wanted to talk to everyone here tonight about, I think it's something that's important and, and affects everybody, is the participation of the police. Um, not just you know in America and also here in Clark County and Las Vegas. Um, I'd, I'd like to open actually with a quote from uh, a Maryland cop, Neil Franklin, which was in the book, The Rise of the Warrior Cop by Rodney Bilko, which is where I got, got a lot of information along with researching uh, some other things and, and articles as well. Uh, this is in reference to the how, not only how police have militarized, but how they, you know, how they think about their job now and how things have changed. Uh, number one, you signed on to a dangerous job. That means that you've agreed to a certain amount of risk. You don't get to start stepping on others' rights to minimize that risk you agree to take on. And number two, your first priority is not to protect yourself, it's to protect those you've sworn to protect. So what, what I'm going to talk about tonight, at first, uh, in general, the militarization and federalization of the police prior to 9-11, but the where it go in the future, uh, Las Vegas and Clark County, uh, some current issues, and I'm talk about my personal experiences with uh, Las Vegas Police Department along with the justice system in Clark County. And then I'm just going to talk briefly about what's going on in the United States in general. Like, this is not just an issue here in Clark County. Uh, the conditioning, police conditioning people basically to obey and not question. And some things that we can maybe do to help to change things. So prior to 9-11, we had the beginning of SWAT. We had the Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968, the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, and of course the drug war, which is a big factor in the militarization of police. Uh, SWAT was something that came from Daryl Gates and the LA, former LA police chief, and I'm sure a lot of you remember Daryl Gates, uh, who was police chief at the time of the Rodney King incident. Um, he was an officer during the Watts riots in 1965. I believe he was a driver for the police chief, but this is where he started to think about you know, SWAT teams and how they could help. Also, the shooting at the University of Texas in 1966. Of course, when everyone talks about you know, gun violence and mass shootings, they forget that this is not you know, something new. So they want to you know, present it as, of course, oh, there's school shootings. You know, it's something new. No, the media covers it a lot more than they did before and distorts things, but that was one of still one of the worst shootings, school shootings in history. Uh, so what it, in, in 1966, they started the uh, Tactical Operations Planning Unit, LAPD, that was intended to respond to and, uh, and plan for big events like you know, riots, protests, and visits from dignitaries, and to suppress criminal activity. So they, they started using military weapons, uh, as well as having you know that type of training and terminology, uh, the Office of Law Enforcement Assistance started in the 60s. It expanded with the Crime Control and State Streets Act of 1968 uh, in the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration. It increased the FBI by 10 percent. Um, it also created some federal research grants for crime prevention, social aspects of crime, and alternative punishments. And it was the first federal agency to streamline federal funding for equipment, technology, directly to state and local law enforcement. So this was something that was uh, signed by President Johnson. So this is kind of the start of federal control over local and state law enforcement. Uh, by, you know, the same way with, for example, something like Common Core, where you say, okay, we're going to give you money, but you're going to do this. So when you're able to kind of control the, the, the cash flow there, it gives you some control over those departments. You know, same thing in, in you know, any instance where you're getting federal funding. Uh, then in the 60s was 
The late 60s started a drug war. There was a Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Later became the DEA, which was uh, created, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs created by Johnson in the mid-60s. Combined some, similar, uh, some smaller agencies in the Treasury, Health, Education, Welfare Department, under the Department of Justice. In 69, uh, Nixon uh, said to Congress that drugs are a national threat. And in the 70s, you have the start of no-knock warrants, which is something that you know led to a lot of a, a lot of these issues. Um, prior to, to that, it was only when innocent lives were at risk they you know executed no knock warrant. It started in Washington D.C. Um, as Congress has power over Washington D.C. They had something called the National Heroin Hotline they established, which was more of a you know report your neighbors type thing. Um, and then of course it was a Controlled Substance Act. The, the major thing about the Controlled Substance Act was it gave power to the Department of Justice and the Attorney General to schedule drugs. They have a schedule one through five, and instead of you know Department of Health and Human Services (FDA), it, it gave it to the Attorney General. And marijuana was actually listed as a Schedule One, and I believe it still is. Uh, of course, in the 80s, you have uh, President Reagan's War on Drugs, the Military Co Cooperation with Law Enforcement Act in 1981, uh, which was use of military training, equipment, and intelligence to assist with the War on Drugs, and that was actually. You know where they might have been doing it before. This is an act that, you know, a law that allowed them to do it. More violations of rights, no knock warrants, confiscation of assets and property, as both law, local and federal law enforcement can take a percentage of that money. So it, it, what it does is, it's an incentive to say, hey, if you go bust some drug dealers, you get to, or drug users, or any anybody who you know may possess any drugs. There was an incident of someone on a farm who had one you know, huge farm, one marijuana plant, didn't even know it was there. But they used that in the end, without going into too much detail, to take the farm and not prosecute. They said, okay, well, we'll work something out is basically you know, losing the farm. So there's a lot of stories about that. Um, there was the Edward Byrne grants and the community-oriented policing grants, COPS, which also was an incentive to that. And then, of course, the SWAT and the DEA started doing excessive raids, military weapons, uh, they used flashbang flash grenades, automatic weapons, armored vehicles, and there were a lot of mistakes where countless examples of the wrong person's house got broken into, or not broken into, but they went to the wrong address, somebody had a heart attack, they shot and killed kids by mistake, they come in where you don't know it's the police, you think it's a robber, you shoot at them, people have been killed, so it, it caused a lot a lot of unnecessary deaths, a lot of issues, and a lot of people that were low-level, uh, for low-level possession uh, crimes. Um, I'm going to go through this as quickly as possible. 9-11 uh, to the President, of course you have the War on Terror, you have uh, the Patriot Act, various grants where federal government is giving grants to you know, all the local law enforcement, of course, NSA spy. One thing I just want to mention real quick, and, and some of you might have this document, is the domestic terrorist threat and the DHS right-wing extremist threat document that I, I handed that out. I only had 10 copies, but it basically labels constitutionalist supporters of liberty, Second Amendment, as, as, and veterans as terrorist threats. On the FBI website, sovereign citizens it tries to equate sovereign citizens with just people that are, the, the quote from the website is, several indicators can help to identify these individuals, references to the Bible, the Constitution of the United States, Supreme Court decisions, or treaties with foreign governments. So basically, anybody who supports the Constitution, it's trying to associate them with, with terrorists. Um, so in, in the future, this could lead to, you know, of course, persecution of political groups, increased surveillance, tracking of citizens. Um, I have on the on the sheet some statistics with uh, drug war statistics, SWAT statistics. I won't go through those, but if you'd like to look at them. Uh, so for Las Vegas and Clark County, currently we have a, a couple things that uh, relate to this. One is we have a fusion center here. The fusion center is the federal, state, local law enforcement sharing intelligence. Uh, there's a FBI, DHS uh, terrorism task force. There's federal grants, and the budget for 2012-2013 is $16 million. Um, there's also $3 million in grants in which they actually apply for, for those. So the, the Las Vegas Police Department you know, is it, basically treating people, labeling people as enemies and threats prior to 
anything. But prior to them actually committing, even committing a crime, you know, officers shoot when they feel threatened. I have an article that I, I attached of the recent, most recent shooting where someone was mistaken for uh, somebody else and was shot who was unarmed. Uh, and then their SWAT team, their call-outs, let me get to my experience, SWAT. Uh, the SWAT team call-outs actually went from 40 in 2012, or 2011 to two, 108 in 2012. So they're increasing their SWAT call-outs, and they have a budget over 8.6 million. So regarding my experience with the Las Vegas Police Department, um, there's actually two incidences uh, I had, and prior to this, I, I've never been arrested in the state of Nevada. Uh, I have a master's degree in business. I have a good job. I'm somebody who I feel contributes to the community. Um, so what, what I want to talk about first is, a, is a, actually the, the, one of the crimes I was charged with, which is obstruction of an officer. This is what they're using to basically, if they have nothing else to arrest you for, they will use obstruction of an officer. And it's every person who, after due notice, shall refuse or neglect to make or furnish any statement, report, or information lawfully required of the person by any public officer, or who in such statement, report, or information shall make any willfully untrue, misleading, or exaggerated statement, but who shall willfully hinder, delay, or obstruct any public officer in the discharge of official powers or duties, shall where no other provision of law applies be guilty of a misdemeanor. And the whole thing is willfully, and it's being used to arrest law-abiding citizens. Um, it's something that was created for, you know, there's a robbery investigation, murder investigation, someone's actually trying to interfere with that. That's what the law is for, not to just, oh, well, I don't feel like you answered my question right, or I felt like you have an attitude, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna arrest you. So the, the, there's actually two instances that I'm gonna talk about. The first was in May 2012, and I'm actually currently appealing this. Um, I was actually in a parked car on private property in the passenger seat. Um, officers came, I guess got a call, not sure why, and they claimed they got a, what was it, a home invasion call, which doesn't make any sense at all. They came up to the car, guns drawn, asked me to get out of the car, me not knowing what they were investigating or what they were even doing, why, what's going on. Um, pulled me out of the car, had bruises all over me, which later I'll uh, pass those pictures around if you want to look at them. Um, and then arrested me for obstruction and officer claimed that when they asked me to get out of the car, I said, no, F you. Which in itself, cursing at a cop is not a crime, but that's not even what happened. So I was, well, first of all, I was in jail for about 60 hours, 20 after I paid bail. And this is not like a holding cell, this is like jail. Uh, where you're in an orange shoot. And I finally, was able to post bail. They had thrown my wallet in my car, I think purposefully, so I didn't have my credit card. Um, I was able to, to have somebody bail me out. Had to go through a bail bondsman, which, you know, is basically you're paying for them to watch you for the police. Um, then I, I ended up, because they didn't want to drop the charges, they wanted to, you know, they were offering some suspended sentence, and I go, well, I didn't do anything illegal. So, I'm, you're not allowed a jury trial. In, in the state of Nevada, if the punishment is a thousand dollar fine, maximum a thousand dollar fine, and maximum six in jail. Um, so I thought uh, there was a good case, especially with the pictures. Judge admitted, said, you know, I I recognize these bruises came from the police, but you're guilty. Which the officers had no. They said, well, what were you investigating? Did you ever get a statement from anybody? No. Did you ever follow up, get information, write a report about it? No. One of the officers didn't remember anything, didn't have a statement, just repeated what the other officer had said. Um, so I, I'm appealing it to district court. It's gonna go in next month, but I've spent $3,000 already. So whether you're found guilty or not, you know, you're the one who, you know, that you're going to have to pay money or you're going to have to, you know, I, like I said, I spent six hours in jail, almost lost, could have lost my job because, you know, I was in there three days. There were other people that were in there for minor misdemeanors. Um, someone was in there for a jaywalking warrant. They showed up on a Saturday to arrest them for a jaywalking warrant, spent five days in jail and lost their job. So this is not even something specific uh, to me. The, the other instance was actually uh, a month ago in October where I was sitting in a parked car, I guess I have bad luck with parked cars. But we were at a business, about to go in, sitting in a car, maybe like 10 minutes at the most with my, my fiance and, and a friend. 
And cops came around with their sirens on, have no idea why. Uh, came over, came up to the, to the car and asked me for my license, you know, why, what's going on. I'm not gonna say what was I, you know, extra friendly smiling, hey officer, and thanks for, you know, harassing me. But, um, you know, at the same time, I'm a little annoyed from my experience with cops. I didn't, you know, dis wasn't disrespectful or anything like that, but that's not a crime. So of course, get out the car, okay, search me, they asked to search me, of course I said no, they have no probable cause, and I had a, a pocket knife about less than three, I think it's either three or less than three inches, if you saw it, you know, no, it's no, you know, you say the same thing, it's no big deal. Um, the officer said, do you have any illegal weapons? I said, no, I, you know, it's a little pocket knife, I didn't even think, you know, think about it. So he charged me with lying, because uh, obstruction of an officer saying, I lied because it's, uh, it's an illegal weapon, and charged me with possessing a knife without a permit, which isn't even a crime. So, luckily, that charge, uh, I got a letter from the DA three days later, they're not, they, they're not gonna file a charge. But my lawyer was gonna charge me, uh, first thing, 2,500, but then 2,000, because it's a gross misdemeanor, the having a knife without a permit, which is actually, if you read the Nevada statute, it's meant for like daggers and swords, you know, because, which makes sense, not like little pocket knives. Um, but what happened with that is when I was in, in actual uh, jail, I didn't really have to go to jail jail because this was a Clark County Detention Center. I got to sit, unlike the other time, for about 12 hours. They were trying to intimidate me to take a TB shot. They want you to sign and say, yeah, we are, we're gonna allow you to treat us. That's what they tell you. I'm like, well, let me see that. So I, I looked at them like, no, I'm not signing and no, I'm not taking a shot. So later, one of the officers says, you know you're holding yourself up from getting processed because you won't sign that and take a shot. I'm like, so you're telling me that you're not, I can't bail myself out, because I told him I'll bail myself out, which I had to wait till eight o'clock in the morning and bail myself out, don't ask me why. Um, $3,000 bail, by the way. And so, we couldn't hear you, how much? $3,000 bail. Okay. I still haven't got it back. I paid cash, which they're all, well, credit card, they're all surprised that someone actually has $3,000 because I think they purposely try to harass people who can't really fight back. But, um, so they still have my money. They told me it would take about two months to get it back so they can earn interest on my $3,000. I'm not rich. I mean, I, I, you know, I paid off my credit card because I didn't want any interest, but there are obviously a lot of people who can't. They want you to hire the bail bondsman so the bail bondsman can watch you. I would have had to pay $450, not refundable to the bail bondsman. Um, but because I didn't take the shot, I was told I had to wear a surgical mask for the rest of my time there. I couldn't use the phone again, and if I ended up in, in a cell, I'd have to be in solitary confinement because you know other people could get TB. So maybe I should wear one here, you know, just walking in, you could all get, I could maybe have TB, who knows? Um, so it's, it, it, it's nuts. And then at the end, when I was already paid my bail, the officer said, um, called my name, and then told me, oh, never mind, you can't leave because you didn't you know, sign this and take your shot. Then, you know, 30 minutes later, it's like, oh, I'm in a good mood now, so I guess I'll let you go. So, I mean, this is what we're, we're kind of going through, it, and this is not something that is just specific, you know, to Clark County. I mean, this is the whole country. I, I see, you know, there's incidents every day, and I put some in the packet. There's a couple articles there. Um, just to really briefly talk about it, in Texas, they had a cavity search of women on the side of the road. California, a dog shot and killed because his owner was filming the police and they arrested him. That, they have the video, it's disturbing. New Mexico, I don't know if anyone's heard about the, the guy who 12 hours was, you know, cavity search in the hospital because they say, you know, he, they thought they had, he had drugs on him. So it, is that really, it, is it okay to violate people's rights to, because drugs are such a threat or that that person had it? Is it more important? Are people's rights less important than the big threat of drugs or supposed threat of ter terrorism in a, in a lot of circumstances? So, actually, okay, just, just real quick as far as um, what, what we can do, because this, this is kind of important. Um, th there are things that we can do, first of all, we, and I put a lot of this information in the packet that I sent out. Jury trials, we, we need, right now, as I said, we don't get a trial for, for mis minor misdemeanors. That needs to change. We need to do what we can to make sure we get a jury trial for any case. Uh, FIJO, which is a fully informed jury association, you have the right to judge the law. You can say, I don't believe this stupid law over here that you're arresting somebody for is constitutional, so I'm voting not guilty. 
our bail system needs to change. The bail is excessive, $1,000 for a misdemeanor, $2,000 for a gross misdemeanor. They make you hire bail bondsmen. It's a racket so the bail bondsmen can watch you. They want you to hire the bail bondsmen. We need to hold our county and state uh, officials accountable. Today I was at the Clark County Commission meeting on the sales tax. Of course, they didn't vote on it again, but I said the same thing there. We need to hold them accountable. The, 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 the sheriff doesn't fund himself. You know, same with Congress. If Congress is gonna gonna fund something, we can we can tell them, you know, don't fund this, and they're they're the ones who are accountable, so they should be held accountable. So we, we need to do that as well. And also know your rights. I put something in there, you know, you can exercise your right to remain silent, you only have to give your name, sometimes ID. Anything you say can be will can and will be used against you, and trust me, it will. And ask it if you're being detained. If they say yes and say I I, I uh Exercise my right to remain silent. So, all, all the reference I have references and links in the back. There's a couple books that are in there: The Rise of the Warrior Cop and A Government of Wolves, which I actually have. You get it. You can get them at the Las Vegas uh, Library. So, thanks everybody. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much, David. Um, this is.